Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good. Welcome back from Berlin. Um, Thank you. I always take care of my friends before myself. So <laughs> welcome back. Uh, and um, well, I, I got a special audio tape to play. Hopefully Rob was able to put it up there. But um, it was you in the Alps yodeling. Do we have that? <laughs> there it is. There it is. It's beautiful. It really is. Uh, it, it just speaks to your dimensional uh, abilities. Uh, you know, so many things you can do. Um, we missed a great opportunity. I really should have come on the air last week with my leader hose and on, you know, the leather shorts. They're like handmade that I got for October. Thank you for Fest. not coming on with me. Appreciate <laughs> you. Look pretty funny. Appreciate you. The fans appreciate you not. <laughs> But yeah, no, no, the the yodeling was enough. Um, <laughs> how were the Alps? I mean, the Alps. Oh my I mean, God! You, you I was to... with. Um, I went to this place called Stangelwurz in um, Kitzbühel, Austria, and coincidentally, that's where the Klitschko spent all their um, training camps at this resort. I mean, it was world class, and the trainer there, a young kid. Um, Bjorn Schwartz, just the nicest kid ever. We did some, we actually did some boxing and I was so rusty and out of shape. I embarrassed myself, but I was trying like hell. And, um, it was just, it was just so idyllic and picturesque just up in the Austrian Alps, like, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger carrying heavy rocks and lifting logs and stuff. But no, it was beautiful. We did some, uh, hiking, saw some waterfalls and stuff. There were cows outside, you know, with the big bells around their neck. Um, it was just awesome. It was, it was a good, it was a good, uh, mental health break after, uh, you know, somewhat disappointing run in, uh, Berlin. And now I've got six days left and I'll try again in Chicago. Yeah. Well, Chicago's coming right around the corner. Um, is that Sunday, is yeah. that normal to, I mean, you go, to go from one mouth, especially such significant ones, from one to another? No, can? no. Typically, you do one in the fall, one in the uh, spring. But because I have already won New York, Boston, got second in London, and now second in Berlin, I was obviously hoping to win Berlin. I'm trying to win the six majors, which is London, New York. Uh, Boston, Chicago, Berlin, and Tokyo. So in March, I'll do Tokyo as well. I was trying to win them all in under two years, but you know I got to roll with the punches. If I can get first or second in all of them and win Chicago and Tokyo, I'll be you know no, I'll be, satisfied. Forget about being incredible. I'm just I'm just wondering if it's almost dangerous for you or, or diff extra difficult. You already in extra difficult. difficult. Yeah. No one would no one would really do this. There was a Japanese kid. Uh, a few years ago who did stuff like this he'd run a ton of marathons but i mean he was elite he won the boston marathon in 2018 but in 2018 it was a very unique situation and actually my friend des linden desiree linden won the women's race and i mean there's no, if there's a woman who represents fighters in running it would be des linden i'll tell you a quick story i think people will really appreciate this so she's running in the boston marathon 2018 it's raining sideways for people who know running it was like one of the coldest races in history when i say raining sideways i'm talking literally you can google it 2018 boston marathon finish women's race she's coming down boylston street and the wind between the wind and the rain it's treacherous she's running in a windbreaker you would never in a million years run a race it'd be like a boxer coming in in long pants you just wouldn't do it so she starts the race and through like 10 miles she's not feeling good and she had finished second in 2011 by two seconds she was in a sprint with a Kenyan back and forth down Boylston the most dramatic finish in the Boston Marathon history and she lost so in her mind and I think in a lot of people's mind she was like is that the closest she's ever going to get did she just blow her chance to win the Boston Marathon the Super Bowl of marathons so Come 2018, seven years later, she starts out and she's like, you know what? She's already failed six times since she came in second to, to rebound and win. And, you know, she's getting a little bit older. So she's legging it and she says, you know what? I'm not feeling good. And in running is while it's an individual sport, you have teammates and stuff that might be out there and you want to work together like one person runs in front of the other breaking the wind a little and you switch back and forth like strategic kind of like kind a like smaller in a, version uh, like in a bicycling when when, exactly. when, you, when you had the yep. great what's his name um lance armstrong, uh, lance armstrong you would have guys on his works. team yep. that, that would shield the wind that's a perfect example. So Desiree says to Shalane Flanagan, who was one of the favorites to win in Boston, an American girl, she said, hey, 
I'm not feeling it today. Let me help you. I'm going to work for you. I'm going to get in the front and stay there, which is a huge help. I mean, it's 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 it, it's undescribable. Like to have someone pace you through the race is a huge benefit to sacrifice yourself. So Shalane says to her, "Hey, I got to stop real quick and go to the bathroom." So she has to jump into like a porta potty. Obviously, it's pouring rain, so. She, she obviously had to do more than pee. So she jumps into the party and Dez slows down, waits for her, and, and Shalane comes running back out and, and Dez says, all right, let's, there's a, there's a lead pack and a chase pack. And Dez says, hey, I'm going to get you up to the chase pack and then I'm probably going to step off the course. I'm not feeling it. So she gets her to the chase pack and she says, all right, let's just push and see if we can catch up to the leaders. I feel pretty good. So she starts going for the leaders, maybe a two minute gap. She looks back and Shalane's gone. So she's like, you know what? I feel like crap. Let me see if at least if I can get with the leaders, I'll get some TV time for the sponsors and then that will be the end of that. So she catches up to the leaders and runs right through them, just keeps going and just carries on and wins the Boston Marathon in 2018. Like when I was watching, we're really good friends. I, I'm telling, I had tears in my eyes. I was like, oh my God, what this, you know how it is, what this represents for her of seven years since she was second, the amount of work and sacrifice and, and, and effort to get back there and now to be doing it in like the worst of worst conditions and she would be the first one to say look on a perfect day when everything is ideal some of those smaller uh, Ethiopian and Kenyan runners they're probably better athletes they're probably going to beat me nine out of ten times but on the day when the Nate when the weather throws you a curveball who has the integrity and the intestinal fortitude to be like you know what I'm going for this. And basically that weather was debilitating to the smaller girls that didn't have like the smaller frame, maybe a little less body fat. I mean, she weighs 85 pounds, not that she's fat, but compared to some of the other girls who are lanky and super lean for whatever reason, and she's mentally tough. Uh, she trains up in Michigan let and me, she won it. Let me tell you something. Her journey prepared her for that though. The defeats prepared her to learn mm -hmm. how to win. And all, yeah, all of that, I mean, all of that, because she was never going to be, if I listened to every word you said, she was never going to be the perfect runner, you know, from yep. a physical standpoint, um, in those kind of ways as far as built for it. But so she had to build all those other areas and those yep. other areas are the areas that, in the end, ultimately, one for uh, that's that's tremendous. I just, you know, I just wanted to touch on that. You know, the reason why I asked you if it's unusual, I figure it was to run this many marathons so close together, because I mean, look at the sport we talk about. You know, boxing, and of course, yep. all fighting. But um, you know, a fighter fights a twelve round fight. You don't see him so long. See you later. We're going to Hawaii. You know, whatever. Yeah, going to yeah, Disneyland. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm. I mean, you're not going to see him for another six, seven. Maybe not for the year. Who knows? But you're not going to see him for a little while. Um, yeah. I mean, what do they fight? Two fights. Once you get to that elite level, and, and you're winning marathons, you're winning. You know, you're a world title fighter. Um, what do you fight? Two of those fights a year, maybe. I mean, it's you know, it's a different time too. It's just a different time in so many ways. Back in the old days in baseball, you know, how do you get your head around these things? How things have changed. Where pitchers would pitch, you know, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There were no relief pitchers. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, they would just I keep know. going. They had rub arms, and and they would keep going. And then they would pitch two days later, whatever you know, whatever <laughs> it was. But nowadays, now they take you after a uh, hundred pitches uh, max. Well, yeah, they take you out. You got to have four or five days rest, and then you know you got to go in, into the garage and check your oil. The uh, you know <laughs> you uh, you got to check all. <laughs> you got. I mean, you got to get a tune up. You got to do this. You got to do that. Uh, I don't know. Did we get softer as, as a species? Yeah, in, yeah. In, in some ways that that back in the day when we didn't have the options. I I once said to a writer, and he found it interesting. I said. Oh, well, he said, what's the difference between the old-time fighters and the fighters today? I said, options. He said, what do you mean? I said, they got too many options today, people yeah. in general. And when you have options, you you don't have to push yourself to do things when there's no options, where, yep. where you have to find a way. When there's more options, you don't have to find that way. You don't have to push yourself. You don't have to go to those deep places. You don't have to go into more rooms in your house and find out you have more rooms in your house, so to speak, yeah. your house being you. Um 
but I mean, again, you go back to the old days, you had a guy like, well, I think people know my favorite fighter is Sam Langford and Henry Armstrong, Joe Lewis. Those are, those are a few of my favorite fighters. Uh, Harry Grab, there's a, there's a few of them. And Armstrong's maybe my favorite. Uh, him and, him and um, Sam Langford, special man. And Armstrong had, I don't know, he, he had close to 300 fights. I mean, one year... Ken, I would love Rob or you to look it up, but one year he fought. Now, we just talked about, you know, guys, if they fight twice a year, whatever, three times, uh, you know, it's like they, they need a vacation. But Henry Armstrong, one time, if I'm not incorrect, he fought over 30 times in a year. And, it, and we're talking about tough fights. We're talking about good fighters. I mean, 30 times, that's a career nowadays, obviously, uh, for a lot of fighters. And, you know, and again, it wasn't like he was fighting popcorns. You know, he was, he was <laughs> you know, <laughs> he, he was, I mean, he was fighting solid guys, real, real tough fighters. Um, do you have a number on there, what, what he fought? Because, I mean, he's got so many fights, but there were years where... I would just I'm love to, to people. I would love thing. to. I just love the audience to hear it, to understand, to put facts to what Teddy's saying here. You know, uh, as far as the huge, huge change in the way people approach things in in every way. His total amount of fights was 181 professional fights, and if that's what if no, that's no, what he's they got had listed, you can he's imagine how many he probably had. Yeah, he's got more than that. Um, there were a lot of fights that, yeah. Uh, they're not listed there. I mean, some of and these. By the way, the, the 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 other thing that I wanted to say was the year that 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 my friend Des won the Boston Marathon. The Japanese kid who won it, he ran a race two weeks before. But again, that was such a unique race that it presented an opportunity for a guy like that who was tough and used to. I mean, the guy raced like seven times a year who's used to that, he showed up ready to go and the conditions presented themselves and he's like, oh, this is right in my wheelhouse. It's like a horse that can yeah, really run in the rain. But he again, might not be the best athlete, but, but he's again, there. But you, again, you had to have honed those skills, those mental skills, those, those character yes. skills. I mean, those were polished. Those were honed. Those were developed, you know, um, by, by the things he was facing and not avoiding. Yeah. Do you see in one year, pick out a good year. Well, like a wine, like you're going into your wine yeah. cellar. Maybe believe you're going into that wine cellar of yours. I know you could get lost in there. It's cavernous. <laughs> but, but, you know, pick out a good year. All right, all right. Uh, he boxed from, he was around in um, 1937. 25 fights in 1920. Oh, man, he never lets me down. You don't either. Rob Moore, <laughs> the producer. 25 fights uh, <laughs> he had one Two year. Two a month. Yeah, yeah. I think he had more than that, but that's enough. <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> that's. I think he had more than that, but 25 fights um, in one year. And and some of these, the reason why I say they have more fights than that, like Archie Moore had close to 300 fights. Sam Langford had about 300 fights. You're not going to get them all listed because back, especially back in the 20s when Sam Langford was around, boxing wasn't even legal in certain states. So they some of the fights were not registered. Some of the fights are not documented where they fought, where they would fight newspaper decisions. What that meant was they would go to a town, they would fight, and they couldn't have a decision because it wasn't legal in that town so, or that state. So the newspaper, the local newspaper um, writers would list in their newspaper the next day who won. They would say they, yeah. would, they would pick who won, and so you you really have to be a historian like a Mike Silver to go back and and figure out and find all the fights that guys like Sam Langford and some of these great great men great fighters really had um, to properly document uh, you know their history. But uh, you know the other thing. I feel like we're a family sitting at a table before we get started with the box. We sit at the table, we chat a little bit. We go, you know, we go over fighting, but we go over life a little bit. We, um, this weekend, I just wanted to mention we, we were, but I always feel you're blessed to meet somebody who could potentially become a new friend. And I don't use the word lightly, friend. I mean, when I say friend, someone who could be tested, someone who could maybe turn out to be somebody that, you know, 
you go down the road with. Um, oh, I was going to say, before you even mention them, they probably don't even realize the, the depth of the compliment that they're getting right now for you to even describe them as a friend upon just meeting them. Usually they have to go through a bit of a trial process. Well, I mean, hey, I mean, you're welcome in. You're yeah. accepted into the apprenticeship program for I mean, friendship status. Yeah, yeah, Check you back in six months. <laughs> Listen, you don't know. It's a, it's a process. I mean, you don't know if someone's yep. a friend until there's... Unfortunately, people say I'm cynical, but um, life can make you look at things in a very honest way uh, if you've been around long enough and in a very real way and everyone has to be tested fighters people friends uh, I don't care everyone and and then you find out hey guys just want to take a quick pause to give a shout out to our friends over at Athletic Greens AG1 check them out at athleticgreens.com use the promo code ATLAS A-T-L-A-S to get 10 of these free travel packs with your first purchase this is the greatest formula out there for an all-in-one daily vitamin. You're getting all your fruits and vegetables in one spot. I love this stuff. Mix it up. Tastes great. I mix it with about a cup of water in the shaker that they provide. It's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients. You're not going to get a better tasting daily vitamin than Athletic Greens. I've been taking this stuff religiously. You see the results I'm getting at 51 years old. It's all part of the process. Training, sleeping, and diet is the third pillar of a healthy sustainable lifestyle if you want to be performing late in life you have to take care of all your uh basics and athletic greens helps me do that especially when i'm traveling i make sure i get all my uh, vitamins nutrients minerals etc etc athletic greens has you covered go to athleticgreens.com use the promo code atlas for 10 free travel packs with your first purchase athleticgreens.com shout out to today's sponsor feel free Check them out at botanictonics.com. This is a kava-based uh, botanical drink. Uh, creates a feeling of euphoria, again, based on the kava root. I love this stuff. Some people say that it helps them to relax. I think it helps me get ready for um, athletic endeavors. I take this before a race, before key workouts. I take it in the morning usually. Sometimes I'll take it right before we record the episode. Um, can't say enough good things about it. Feel Free is the name of the drink, and it's the maker is Botanic Tonics. Go to botanictonics.com. Use the promo code ATLAS, and they'll give you 40% off your purchase botanictonics.com feel free I, I always remember a story cuz grew up in a tough place up up in the Bronx Brooklyn Boulevard and I always remember he would he would tell me when he was young a friend of his came to him and he was very upset he said you know I'm what are you upset about cuz he said I'm upset everyone came to cuz he was a smart man uh, about life and he said I'm upset because I just found out after 20 years that so-and-so was my friend. Cuz said to him, how do you know he was ever your friend? And he, he got insulted. He looked at him. He said, how could you say that to me? I just told you 20 years that he's been my friend. He said, well, I'll say it again. How do you know in 20 years that he was ever your friend? Was there ever a test? I'm not talking about drinking a beer together. I'm not talking about chasing girls together. I'm, you know, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about was there ever a test where you needed him, where it was inconvenient for him to be around? Was there? Oh, uh, no, today. Today. Well, see what I'm saying? Today. Today was that day. So I'm just saying, it, it was a nice guy, uh, uh, a, a guy named Pedro. He, he came in from Miami, and that brings me to something else. I, I just want to send out prayers and thoughts to all the people in Miami, not just Miami, but Florida, um, to the coastal areas that got yep. really hit by uh, Ian, uh, Ian, whatever you pronounce the hurricane, um, got got hit terribly and put underwater. Um, there was loss of life there, loss of property, but nothing replaced his life. Uh, you can always replace the property, and also Puerto Rico, and also the Carolinas. So again, uh, again, we're, we're human. We're, we're we're without without people, we can't do this. And um, without good people, we can't do this. And without caring people, we can't do this. That care about sports, care about boxing, care about the things we talk about. And for me, that means generally care about life. So our prayers and thoughts to all those people that have suffered uh, in those areas. And you know, hopefully, hopefully, is, you know, things will come back to normalcy as fast as possible. And um, but he came in. He came in from Florida, Pedro, and he 
Uh, we, he came over for dinner. He's a huge fan. He loves you, by the way. He follows his... Uh, that was the only thing. That almost got him thrown out of the house. But he, <laughs> he, 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 he loves the podcast. And, I mean, he watches it religiously. And, but he's a, you find out things about people. He's a big boxing fan, but boxing part of his life. He, was, he actually... He's a lawyer. Very successful lawyer. Uh, but that's not the thing about him. The thing about him is the kind of person he is. He's a decent person. And um, he, he, he did some professional kickboxing when he was young. And he was around a guy, a special guy, uh, a guy named Bojack, who was lightweight champ of the world way, way, way back, you know, in the 30s, whatever it was, and um, 30s, 40s. Um, he, he fought a long time. But um, maybe it was the 40s, yeah. And he was lightweight champ of the world, Bojack, and what a tough son of a gun. I think he sold out Madison Square Garden more than anybody else, any other fighter. And I think that record might still stand. Uh, pretty damn. Look, it tells you all you need to know. It tells you that he was a ticket seller. It tells you that, that he was a fan-friendly fighter. It tells you he was a tough son of a gun. And, you know, sometimes he might not have moved his head enough because uh, <laughs> he, 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 that's why the fans loved him. But this... this um, man who came over that we had the pleasure of have coming to our house he he met him but he was a part of his life he actually was involved in his life when he was young so he, he you find out that you know i thought he was just coming over dinner a boxing fan blah 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 but you find out that no there was more to it and more to his connection to the sport that's my life um, yeah. boxing and he brought a gift I just wanted to show to the audience I, he didn't have to bring nothing I mean you know a couple of cannolis would be nice although you know <laughs> I, I'd probably have to turn them down but he I, I just had to share this with the audience with you guys he um, oh wow that's this, real nice is this, a fight poster framed yeah do you see it yeah, I see it, Muhammad Ali, Larry Holmes. Do you know this? Beautiful. I mean, this goes back so far. Um, I think that, let me see the date. Let me just look at it. I think the date is uh, 1974. But, and, and, and the uh, ringside tickets were $5, general admission too. It was a charity event. But just a rare, rare poster. And for him... And it was an exhibition. He was, Ali was uh, spawned with about three, four guys. One of them was a guy named Larry Holmes. And, you know, it's just for somebody to go and take the time to find something that they thought would be uh, obviously interesting to you and that you would enjoy and you would like and would mean something uh, speaks to the just speaks to the depth of the person, uh, the kind of person we're talking about. So I, I just want to mention, I just feel we're blessed when we can meet somebody that could add to our lives as far as just a decent person. You know, uh, I, I, I meet people, I tell them, they say, oh, it's nice to meet you. Maybe. Uh, they feel that <laughs> way, I hope. And then I say, you know, it was my pleasure because anytime you could meet decent people, especially today, uh, things are getting tougher and tougher out there where you you feel you've met people that enhance your life that are decent people. Uh, you just feel, you know, you just feel blessed uh, in in that way. But... Uh, well, Teddy, I, speaking of decent people, I wanted to bring something up and I know you wouldn't bring it up so I wanted to talk about it and that is, uh, you know, we, we had the Shakur Stevenson fight against uh, Kenseiko or Kensayo, whatever his name was, Robson, Kenseiko. Uh, anyway, after the fight, you know, you had some commentary like as just an unbiased analyst, like, hey, Shakur Stevenson hit him with about 52 low blows that were unaccounted for. You know, when you had a, just a, 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 I don't know, maybe a critique, whatever it was, it was just an observation. It wasn't a personal attack. Well, Shakur Stevenson showed complete immature attitude and decided to lash out at you personally for having anything less than um, high praise for him. And I just say to Shakur, man, relax, dude. Someone's, there's always going to be people that have 
opinions about you, good, bad, or indifferent, instead of lashing out and, and, and using terrible language and talking like a, a, like a maniac, take a minute and think, I wonder if there's any validity to what he's saying. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But responding to every critic, you're in for a long, painful road, dude, just in life. Relax. Someone, someone wasn't f like fond of your performance. Who cares? Did you get paid? I think you did. Are you going to get another fight? I know you are. Relax, man. This isn't a personal, it's not a personal attack. No one has a personal problem with you. We don't have personal attacks against fighters on this show. Teddy gives his opinions. I agree or disagree. And we move on. We wish everyone well. But to, but to lash out wildly at someone's character and, per, and attack Listen, them personally, Ken, Ken. man, it shows a level of maturity that's just lacking massively. Listen, Ken, I just... I, I I didn't know you were going to jump in there with that, and I I appreciate you. Well, it's offensive to me as your friend because no, no, I know I you're not trying to attack the guy personally, and he he is attacking personally. Well, it's stupid. No, it's okay. Childish. It's okay. Listen, he, he's not the first. He won't be the last. Um, when you're in this business, you know we we used to joke. You know, it's life in a big apple. Um, when you're in this business, you're out there. You're in the public view. Uh, people can say what they want to say because you're out there. You're out there giving your opinion. And I get it. I do get it. You, I, do you have to get mean and all that stuff? Because I'm not getting mean. Like if I say something, I'm saying it critically, with critical, uh, constructively critically, uh, with constructive criticism, where, uh, first of all, it's funny how quick some people forget when I was very complimentary that he's a very talented fighter, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, but then if I critique it, first of all, it's my job. My, my job is not to do, you know, we, we joked around a little bit. And um, matter of fact, uh, I, you know, we joked around a little bit. And, and I see something here that um, uh, I just realized. I, I got some tissue papers here. <laughs> that could be important. That that could be important. That could be part of the show where um, somebody gets their feelings hurt. I, I'm 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 there. I'm there with the tissue papers, whatever I can be there with. But uh, more more seriously, you know, he forgot real quickly when he got complimented. But I'm not. My job is not to knock or compliment or any. My job is to say what has to be said, what I deem to be the truth from 50 years of experience in this game, both as a fighter, amateur fighter, as a trainer for many years, as a commentator for many, many years, and as a student for many, many years. Um, you know, lucky enough to have learned on, at the feet of the late, great Customano. Um, where I sacrificed, like anyone else, but seven years up in Catskill. I was fortunate to be able to do that, but seven years just learning how to be a fighter and a trainer, um, nothing else, every day, seven days a week. So I've, I developed those, those abilities, those judgments um, the right way. And... I try to put them out there the right way. Does it mean that I'm always right? No. But it's not my job to do what... I don't think it's the commentator's job either. But the commentators on the show that you just brought up that we're talking about last week, they were just cheerleaders. And I'm not trying to... Well, I am knocking them. But I'm not trying to knock them. They knock themselves by putting themselves in that category by behaving that way. Otherwise, I couldn't say it. They're just cheerleaders. That's not my job, okay? My job's not to be a cheerleader. My job is, again, to, to speak to the audience. My job is, for me, is to tell the audience what's happening, what they might not know what's happening, to enhance their ability to watch a fight, to judge a fight. To, to break down a fight, to appreciate a fight, to hopefully enhance it a little bit. That's my job. And my job also is to protect my sport. Yeah, that, I've made that my own job over the years where, yeah, I was collecting a paycheck for all those years at ESPN, but I got in trouble. Why? I got in trouble for, again, going maybe beyond the realm of my job because I thought it was to protect the fighter, to protect the sport. Or at least I had the chance to do that. So since I had the chance to do that, I figured, you know what? I'm getting paid, 
And on top of it, I could do something even just even more worthwhile in some ways than just getting a paycheck to actually help the sport, help the fighters. And if I saw something that was corrupt, something that was wrong, something that was broken, that needed to be fixed, I said it, whether it was with the judge and whether it was with the, you know, the, the executives in the sport, whether it was with the ratings organizations, the, 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 the referee, whatever it happened to be. Because ultimately, when it's wrong, it hurts the sport and it hurts the fighter. And again, I thought, wow, if I can make a choice to do more than just get paid, to maybe help a little, I'm freaking doing it. And I've been doing it for a long time, trying to do it the best I can. And my, what happens, in, and this is for the world, with, with, he's a talented kid, 25 years old, my God, he won a silver medal. He's fast, he's talented, he's a good defensive fighter. You know, and he's all those things. And I've said it. But he's also a kid who's been privileged. Yeah, he worked hard to develop those skills. But he's been lucky. He's been privileged. He's, he's in a position where he's taken care of, where he's able to realize his dreams. God bless him. God bless him. I wish everybody could. Not everyone can. God bless him. And he's worked hard for that. But, you know... When when you when you're in that position, what happens is with all these athletes, football, baseball, basketball, whatever it happens to be, boxing, a lot of them when they're young and they start showing this promise, Ken, and this ability to be special and quite frankly to make money, a lot of people don't tell them the truth anymore. They why? Well, truths are different for everybody in life. The truth for these people is the truth that it could get in the way of them earning a living, of being around them, being part of the entourage and whatever that leads to. That's their truth. That's their truth. It's different than my truth. My truth is to say what's there to be said. And in the hope that it enhances the the watch of the audience, that it also can help the sport better itself and that it can help the fighters. You know how many fighters over the years I've been blessed where I was critical on ESPN Friday Night Fights and I saw them years later, sometimes less than years later. Sometimes they showed up again on another show and they came up to me and said, Teddy, thank you. Yeah, who are you? I don't remember sometimes uh, on a four-round fight, a six-round fight. Who, uh, I'm so and so. Oh, how are you doing? Good. Uh, you know, because I'm honest. I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. And then I remember. And, and they say, you knocked the crap out of me, but I appreciate it because you know what? You were right, and I worked on those things. I said, "You look damn, you look damn good tonight," or you know, "How you been doing?" Well, I've won five fights in a row, and I'm I'm doing okay, and I'm working on the things you said, and you know, you don't always get that, but you get it enough where you say, "Wow!" Some people get it, and again. A lot of these kids that have that special power, like Stevenson, that, that special ability, I should say, that they, they get surrounded by people that are there for their own purpose rather than their purpose. Really, that the, they're there to be around a the winner. They're there, there to be around someone special. They're there to be maybe to make money off of it. So they don't necessarily want to risk that. Because there's a risk in telling somebody the truth. Look at the risk. He called me nasty names. I don't think you have to go there. Okay, okay. But it speaks to what I'm saying, that he's not mature enough yet. You know, I said he got frustrated in that fight with Ken Seiko, right? Ken Seiko don't have the talent he has, but he's a veteran. He's been around, uh, you know, and so he got frustrated. And he did. He threw him to the floor. You know, he hit him low. I thought he hit him low a dozen times. It turns out that somebody actually did a study on it and came out with a video that it was like 60 something times. It was like, I didn't even realize it was that many times. And listen, if you're getting, and then yep. what happens? He gets frustrated and then he gets frustrated when I say it and he gets nasty. The point I'm making is if me saying something that is honest and that is constructively critical upsets you, you got a problem because 
Yeah. There's going to be much tougher things in the ring that you're still going to face on your journey. You're, you're only 25 years old, and you faced a little bit of that, and you got frustrated that that the truth was you couldn't get rid of the guy. The truth was he caught you some punches where he timed you because timing can beat speed. And even though you were faster, he timed you. He timed you in the middle of a punch or a combination. Or when your head came back to the middle, he timed you. Yeah, he did. Correct that. And it frustrated you. And if that's going to frustrate you, you're not at that level yet of your abilities. Your abilities are great, but your maturity isn't yet quite there and your development in other areas to use your skills isn't quite there so i'm 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 just pointing out something that you know the the to make a light of it just to kid around there's an old commercial i used to always joke about and always bring up actually oh uh, i think it was a fram oil filter and the guy used to say pay me now or pay me later <laughs> you know uh, get uh, uh, face the fact that you got to get a good oil filter now or later on when you have to get an engine job uh, that's kind of like what i believe in like face you know pay me now or pay me later. pay now for the for the blessing of constructive criticism son and and maybe learn something from it or pay later when it's too late when when it's the whole engine now it's it's not just the brakes you know it's not just uh, a, a small part of the car you know it's not just a carburetor now now it might be a whole engine job and that's a whole different story that's a more serious thing so again a lot of these elite athletes they get babied they get cuddled uh they hear nothing but what is nice to hear. And I like to hear it too. But it's not the real world. It's not the real world. The truth, you know, there's an old saying, um, the truth hurts. You know what? I, this is what I feel. I don't say that. I say that the truth helps. That the truth saves you. I don't say the truth hurts. You know what I say? Lies hurt. And what I'm saying is, I'm not trying to make him, you know, shake up his world because he ain't going to listen anyway. But um, look around you. We just talked a little bit about friends. I didn't know we were going to go down this road today, but they have to be tested. Uh, are those people really your friends? The ones that are telling you anything you want to hear? Are they really your friends? I, I tell you one thing, it's it can be a lonely experience and a tough experience that if you don't, if something goes awry, if something goes a little bit crooked later on in your career, and you still got a long way to go, you still got a long way to go, and God bless you, good luck. Really, good luck. Uh, I wish everyone good luck, but it's a long journey. And if something goes wrong, you know what the truth can be sometimes? I'll tell you what the truth, I've been there. The truth can be leaving a very crowded locker room with all the yes men, all the enablers, you know, all the lackeys, if you will, all the people that you thought were your friends, whatever, whatever, even the commentators, all that. And coming back, when things go maybe a little awry, coming back to an empty locker room. That can be a tough truth. And and, and, and I'm just trying to help with I'm, I'm doing my job to the audience, but at the same time, I'm always hopeful that maybe it'll help someone. Not to hurt their feelings. No. But but help somebody in that way. In that way. Because that is the truth. That, that, that truth does hurt. You come back and all of a sudden there's no one around. And, and, somebody, and then you ask somebody, where is everybody? And you know what the answer comes back again? I was there. I was there in a freight elevator with a fighter when this happened. So I know what the answer was. He turned to somebody. He turned to, to a person that was with me. It was just me and him. And the fighter said, where is everyone? And the answer came, not from me, from the other person. Good person, honest person. This is everybody. Wow. Wow. That hurts. That's tough. That's difficult. So... Oh, and, and the last thing I'll say on that, you know, he threw out all that you got nasty. If you're going to get nasty over that, nasty. I didn't get nasty. I mean, you're going to get nasty over that. Really, again, when the real stuff, <laughs> the real stuff comes in a fight, 
You how <laughs> how are you going to be affected by that? How if you can't deal with this, how are you going to deal with that? It speaks to the truth of what I'm talking about, son. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. And he got he he said he threw a few nets. Oh, Tay Adams always talking good about Lomachenko. Let me just tell you something, okay? As long as you went down that road. I, I talk good about Lomachenko. I talk just as good about Tank Davis. I don't, I don't love every way that Tank represents himself, but i tell you one thing. I give him all the credit in the world for the fighter that Tank is. Tank, Tank has developed into more than just a puncher. He's a freaking complete fighter. He can counter. He can go get you. He can box. He, he can endure. He can keep himself together. I mean, he's a he's a hell of a boxer. I think Ryan Garcia, all those guys are developing, really, really coming along. Um, you know, whether it's Haney, whether it's Lomachenko, uh, whether it's Tigo Firma Lopez, they still got a ways to go. I've been critical of all of them, and I give them their praise when they deserve it. But Lomachenko, since he brought him up, the guy's won three titles in three different weight classes. He's overcome a lot of tests. A lot of things that fighters have to overcome. Not, not just with talent, with perseverance, with character, with depth, with stuff that's beyond just the, the shiny stuff, the neon stuff. Like being reliable. When it's hard to be reliable, that's a talent. That's an asset. You have to learn that. You have to go through that. And Lomachenko, I've seen him. So I think he earned my praise. <laughs> hey, so pick somebody else when you say, oh, Teddy says he's so good. You know, he, uh, no, pick somebody else. Because that guy, yeah, that guy kind of earned it. And maybe you're going to surpass him in your career, uh, Stevenson. Maybe you will. You know what? I hope you do. I hope you do. But before you do it, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to come to terms with certain things, and you're gonna have to meet something head on. Maybe the maybe it'll be your greatest uh, foe out there, and his name is Truth. And that's it. That's 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 all I got to say. And um. And I would say this to other fighters that are listening: when you feel like you want to get on Twitter and talk like crazy to someone. Take a deep breath. Right. No, no. Take a deep breath. Relax. It's okay. You yeah, can't it's right. lose if you don't engage in that kind of trash talk. You don't look better when you talk. You can't like, win. You meant to say you can't win. Right. When you talk like that, your words say more about you than the person that might have been critical of you. And I've learned this myself. I say things sometimes that I'm like, why did I do that? But I can tell you for anyone listening, Twitter isn't the place to air your grievances. The ring is where you show everyone how you feel. Okay, you don't like criticism. No big deal, but you don't attack people personally. It just makes, it says more about you okay. and your character. Listen, it's okay. You know what it also says though, Ken? He's watching. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Fair point. And, well, <laughs> No, like no, really. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali, the great, 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 great Muhammad Ali once said that um, half the people that come into the arena to see me um, hate me. <laughs> have to come. They love me. He said, but they all have one thing in common. They all come. They yeah. all buy a ticket. And and that's really, I, I appreciate you being here to watch us, Steve, um, Shakur, and, and uh, many other people. And I'll say one other thing. I love the audience. Even when you don't agree, I just love you guys. And you guys all came out. Just like Ken's talking about, um, I wasn't going to talk about this, but you guys all came out. I mean, I was going to talk about it a little bit probably, but not to this degree. But you know what? Those fans get the truth. So many of you just came out and said, why don't you be quiet? Uh, Teddy's just say, doing his job. He's telling the truth. And I, I appreciate you guys. Not just because you, you are on my side, because so many years were. And he got mad at you guys. He started getting mad at you guys. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know what I mean? So 
I I just appreciate decent people, people that aren't afraid to say the truth, that aren't afraid to say what's not convenient to say sometimes. At the end of the day, you're going to be able to do other things. If you could do that, you could do other things better. I often say that a fighter, what I try to do is, I've had fighters that come back to me. Some of them made it high, some didn't. And they come back and they say, you made me a better person. And I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Because I always feel boxing, whether you make it to the top or not, if you go through the things that boxing offers, that, that challenges you with, you become a better person. Or you get out of it. But if you stick to it longer, you become a better person. And those things will stay with you. They will stay with you and, and help you do other things and achieve other things and face other things in different kinds of fights in your life. And they will. They, may, they will. They make you stronger. They, they make you realize that you can handle things. So the last thing I want to touch on, get off of this, the last thing I want to touch on is our great fans across the pond, um, you know, over there in the United Kingdom, they got a little mad at me, not in a bad way. They're, it's all love. It's all love. We've, I mean, once you've sat down with these fans and you shared crumpets, it's always <laughs> love. It's always it's love. And they, um, they said, Teddy, uh, I, I was talking about, uh, I was talking about Joyce, Joe Joyce being like, uh, you know, I had said for a long time that he reminded me of George Foreman, and. Uh, I think he's going to sell out an arena. I think he's going to fight for a title. I think he could beat. Uh, I think that he would knock out uh, uh, Joshua right now. And Joshua wouldn't even fight him. You know, all that. And it's not being critical of Joshua. I'm just saying that that's how I feel. But that's not what they were upset about. What they were upset about was I was talking about how great it is that the heavyweights and other fighters too over in Great Britain, over in the United Kingdom are built up. That it's easier to build them up over there than it is over here because over here you have so many distractions. You know, you got Tiger Woods, you got LeBron James, you got Tom Brady, uh, you got, you know, and you got all these other sports. And so that it's just easier to make them identifiable to people where they can become big stars, you know, over, over there than it is here. And they got mad at me a little bit. They said, and not mad. They just said, Teddy, you got to remember, we have other sports here too. You know, we have rugby, we have soccer. You're right. No, no, and I mean this. I'm not doing this in just, just now. You're right. You're right. Soccer is the biggest sport in the world. And you have huge soccer stars and you have huge rugby and what men they are. What, what strong, tough men they are. So, yeah, you have huge stars in rugby and soccer over there. Yeah, it's true. You don't only have darts and and snooker you know you 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 have did i did i get that in there uh yeah you you have those other sports and um no but seriously you're right but i still say it's a smaller pond if you if you don't mind me making that sort of it's not a pun but it is a smaller pond so it is easier to make those fighters over there identifiable and i'll give you an example way way back years ago there was a heavyweight over there joe bugner now joe bugner was huge over there good fighter uh, but you know but he couldn't quite quite get over the hump and beat the top guys it was but hey the top guys were special back then they happened to be around his time but joe bugner never would have been nearly as big over here as he was there nearly and I'll tell you another one more recently, Frank Bruno. Frank Bruno, yeah, good puncher. I mean, he, he looked like a statue of Adonis uh, and a real fine gentleman, everything. Uh, you know, really conducted himself like a great gentleman, uh, uh, you know, in and out of the ring. But he wouldn't have been anything near what he was over there. He was huge over there. He wouldn't have been that over here for the reason I'm saying. Because it's harder to build those identifiable stars in boxing over here than it is over there because there's too much other stuff going on over here. So I just want to say that I apologize to my great, great uh, British fans, all great British fans over there that I, you know, I really care about you guys. Um, I, you know, I'd like to sit down and have a cup of tea with you and share another crumpet with you. But, um, when, if it's ever possible, but I feel like I do that every week when we talk about 
things that are important to you guys over there. And and you're right. You have rugby, you have soccer, you, you do have other sports over there. And you even have NFL football goes over there now. Um, you know, they go over there like a couple times a year now because the NFL, of course, is very aware of spreading their brand internationally. So they, they, they go to the stadiums over there. But I just wanted to say that. And um, love our British fans. Uh, I'm going to have a cup of tea later. And I'm going to, we're going to talk about um, some of the fights coming up. And Well, first we want to touch on the uh, main event, the UFC, uh, incredible women's fight. Uh, Mackenzie Dern against the Chinese fighter Yan. Uh, great fight, back and forth. Um, a couple of warriors. Uh, Yan gets the win, but she barely escaped the last round. I think Dern realized she was probably ahead on the scorecards. And my God, she came out like... <laughs> like a house on fire and uh, she almost had her in an arm bar she yawned to her credit kept escaping and evading but man i would say uh yawn just um Dern just ran out of time here the tide was turning and it was turning in a hurry but uh i know you watched this one and i'm dying to hear your thoughts so uh how'd you like that female fight on ufc yeah listen uh, the way that i've come to expect most ufc fights ken you know, to be, I mean, they go in different directions here and there, depending on the talent in the ring and the styles in the ring and all that stuff. But uh, just a two tough competitors, competitor fight, again, well-matched, two tough competitors, different styles, made it very interesting, and just a tough, gritty, gritty uh, fight. Um, and again, no, no shock when you're talking about what you're getting for the brand over the UFC. And matter of fact, I would say that the card, you know, some people say it was a weaker card, it was this, there, but a lot of quick KOs, sudden submissions on the card and on the undercard, but excitement, excitement, and, uh, you know, good, good stuff to watch. Um, again, not one of their big cards, but the women's fight. We we want to we want to bring everything to our audience. We we don't want to leave something out that we know you that you care about. So we make sure that we cover this stuff, uh, that we cover these things. And I even put out a few tweets out there. And again, uh, as I try to do with people that are important to me, my all star Twitter team. Uh, it's Twitter, good, yeah, Twitter tweet team, whatever. Rob Moore, Brennan Wood, uh, Ian Mackey. I appreciate you guys uh, always getting it up there. And it wasn't the audience you usually have because we didn't get quite the response we normally get, but I'm glad we did it. And, and I'm glad that the fans still like us to do it. As I said, very good, solid main event. Um, just a tough competitive fight. Dern, Dern is a beast on the mat. Ken, um, and that's obviously that's where she wanted to be. Her choice of geography, as I talk about, you got to get the geography that makes sense for your skill sets. And when she could get there, she did. But her Achilles heel, if that's fair to say, and I think we all have, we all have them, is her striking. You know, she. I, I think that's what really. Uh, that's where she came up short because to the credit of Jan, she realized her geography was to strike and she stayed on her feet as much as she could and she struck. And where, I'll tell you where, as far as the striking uh, and Dern needing to work in that area a little bit, she's strong. She's a force. She's relentless. She pressed forward all night long. But where she missed the boat and that hurt her was with a more accomplished striker. She didn't press behind the jab. So when she was pressing, she was getting counted. She was getting pot shotted. She didn't put bugs on the windshield. Like I say in, used to say at ESPN when I was calling the fights, where you have to make the person who's looking to counter you, you have to put bugs on their windshield. You have to make it hard for them to clearly see you, uh, to clearly time you. And... Ken, Jan was able to pot shot, move around, make the ring a little bigger, keep her off balance, and pot shot with counters, 
uh, you know, quick combinations uh, on Dern. And again, Dern kept pressing, kept pressing, kept pressing. A couple things missing. One was she should have pressed behind the jab, as I said. The other was she should have used feints. Because if she fainted every once in a while before she came in, she would have drawn out the counters from Jan instead of walking into him. Yeah, good point. So, that, yeah, so those are things I saw she was missing. But i tell you what she wasn't missing. Heart, in the, both of them. Heart, determination, resiliency. She just kept coming. And when she did get on the floor, on the mat, she had her moments. I mean, she won on the mat. But this was the difference in the fight for me, right here. When they got on the floor, when Dern got to her geography and got Jan out of her geography, which was standing on her feet striking, when that happened, Jan did a hell of a job of surviving and, and just defending from the submission. That, that, and sometimes she did more than that. She actually got the edge. But she defended from the submission when she had to. And all that pressure, that relentless pressure without the jab, but just coming forward, coming forward, coming forward by Dern. It finally paid off the fifth round, and it got Jan to stay still, succumb a little bit to the pressure where she could get the takedown. She needed it. She needed that take. You know, it's funny. I look at the difference, my sport and that sport boxing in that sport and and I when when a fighter's in that position he needs the knockout. He needs the knockout. And then I saw this one, I said, Dern needs the submission. That's her knockout. She needs the submission right now. That's what she needs. And she almost got it. I mean like she put it this way. She didn't almost get it, but she got it to where she needed to. Like if I'm gonna use the football analogy, football season now, she got it close enough to the goal line to have a shot to score before time ran out. She got it into the red zone. She got onto the floor. She got onto the mat, and she tried like hell. Ken, she tried like hell to get the submission, but that's where the difference was. Jan was good enough not to let her get that submission, tough enough and, and smart enough. Not to get. Matter of fact, Jan flipped it around at the last five seconds and she got on top and she <laughs> she started pounding a little bit for the last five seconds, you know, where she had the edge. But that was the difference. When each got their geography, like when Jan got her geography, she made the most of it, striking. And she won pretty clearly in those areas. When Dern got her striking, Ge uh, geometry and listen the fifth round she might have had a 10-8 round she she got a lot out of it but not as much as Jan got out of her geography her advantage so to speak where Jan got a little bit more out of it where it was all Jan and for Dern when she was in her place her territory her location it wasn't as dominant fifth round like I said might have been 10-8 but for the most part wasn't as dominant as when Jan got to her territory. I think that's the best way I could break this fight down. And uh, Jan built up enough of a lead. She's very, She knew, she was cognizant of it. She built up enough of a lead where she knew in that fifth round she could go into a prevent defense. And here, again, when we see prevent defense, we think of NFL, you know, and all that, and uh, softening up in the secondary and letting them catch the, the catch in front of you and then running out the clock. Her, her version, Jan's version of, 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 you know, of this, uh, what do you call it, defense, her, her, her version was much more painful, her version of it, because she had to endure. Her version was to, once she got taken to the mat, you know, she, yeah, she wanted the clock to run out, uh, her prevent defense, but she had to survive and she had to take pain. She had to take a lot of pain for her, for her version of, of prevent defense to work. But it paid off for her. It paid off for her. She, she took pain for probably four and a half minutes or, or somewhere in that neighborhood. And she survived. She lost the round, but she won the fight. You know, uh, she won the war, 
So I was very impressed by both. Kudos to both. Hats off to both. Uh, I think Dern has to work a little bit more on the striking, but she's a beast. Uh, they both are. They're both beast in the nicest, best way. I can, you know, I mean, if obviously in the best way, you you shouldn't be calling women beasts. But I think in this particular vocation, people understand what I'm talking about. Um, I hats off to them. I admire them both. Uh, I say this in closing: Jan has fought everybody, every style. Kind of like when you bring a fighter up. I want a fighter to fight all different styles. So when they finally get their shot, they're ready for whatever it is that's going to be that you might not have a choice over who the champion is. And that's Jan. Jan has fought every style and 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 really really good fighters. She's ready. She's ready for whatever's coming next. So when her big shot comes, and I would think it's coming, she she's going to make the most of it because of her preparation, because of the journey she's been on, you know, because of what she's not avoided, because of what she's not avoided, you know. Um, so I was very, I was very taken and impressed. Uh, I really was. Yeah. Let's talk about some uh, upcoming fights and then uh, some fights that are hyped to supposedly be happening. But first, let's talk about Haney and uh, Cambosa 2 rematch. Obviously, Cambosa took the titles from um, Tifimo Lopez. Haney went down to Australia, handled this business. Now they're rematching in Australia. I'm actually surprised with the ease of which this fight got done. I thought it would be... Um, I thought they'd have a harder time getting it done, and I was surprised that it got done in Australia again. But credit to Haney. I think he knows he has the upper hand here. Well, that here. was the deal. Yeah. No, credit to Haney because he's a man. Yes. You know, we know he's a fighter. We know he's an athlete. We get it. But he understood what he agreed to. Yep. You know, yeah, but not everyone does. From, this he is, agreed. Yeah, but 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 we're talking about him. Yeah. We're not talking about everyone else. We're no, talking yeah. about him. We're giving credit to him, Ken, because... The you other are, one should, but they don't. You're I can't 100% help them. fair. T Haney, I, well, I still want to give Haney the credit he's due because usually when someone wins the belt, all kinds of like effery ensues and, you know, this, they, they got clauses and they, they claim this, claim that. But anyway, it's happening two no, weeks. No, no, here's the thing. Here's the thing with him to close that up. He, he had to agree to leave his promoter to let someone else promote him. He'll go back to him, yep. but temporarily, which he didn't want to do. He had to agree to go to Australia. That's normal. You got to go to the champion's place. He went there, and then he agreed to a rematch. He had no choice yeah. that uh, you know to to fight a rematch right away first. And yeah. he lived up to his agreement. That's why he's a champion. For me. I, it goes beyond the skill sets. I know, but you would, agree that, you would agree that it's you would agree that it's rare word. that someone keeps their word even once they it have shouldn't the belts. Be rare. I know. No, I, I would agree. agree that it shouldn't be freaking rare. 100%. That's what I agree. We're to. on the same page. And I, yeah, rematch, I know we are. So rematch coming up two weeks on the fifteenth. I think Haney wins more convincingly, but more importantly, what do you think? All right, he won pretty handily the first time, but yeah. um, listen. He should be even more comfortable to what he has to go through uh, now going down under and over there after doing it once. So you would think that the the couple of weeks he's got to go go over there to acclimate would be even better set up and even more comfortable. In the I first would assume time he's he already his, there. Uh, yeah, I, I and, hope and he is. You would think, uh, and you would think that you know the first time he couldn't have his father to the last oh, minute. Oh yeah, that's um, right. I forgot about that. There was a pass. Uh, there was a problem obviously with allowing him to come. Over, you know, uh, to get his what do you call it visa, um, visa, and and so you would think that that's behind him. He dealt with that. That didn't get him. Um, so you would think that it would only be better with the experiences of being in there already. Uh, once and he's not the kind of guy who's gonna go to his head that he that he's got all the belts now that you know he's gonna get fat in the head. Uh, I don't think he's made up that way. This guy is a consummate pro, I think, and a consummate boxer. That's what he is. He he's not gonna he, he's not gonna go blow you out with TNT or anything like that. You know, he catch you clean. He got, but he's not a TNT puncher. Tank Davis is a TNT puncher. He's not that, but he's a consummate boxer. He he's pretty to watch. He, he yeah he's pretty. You know, and I mean that again in a complimentary way. Uh he he's clean. You know, he boxes. 
uh, you know, in and out, uses legs, combinations, good hand speed, accuracy, uh, surgeon, a little bit of a surgeon, you know, with his punches where, you know, he, he's, he's very precise with them, accurate, puts together smart combinations. Again, he's a consummate boxer. The thing that scares me, keeps his head up in the air a little bit sometimes. Um, sometimes you could time him going out. Uh, I'd like to see him coming to the side doors a little bit more. Sometimes I'm not knocking anybody over there. They've done a superlative job. They don't. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I'd like to see him add the dimension coming off the sides. He, he goes in and out. Um, he counter punches. He beats you to the mark. You know, um, if he's got to get down and dirty, he could do that for a minute too uh, on the inside. But his thing is to control distance, control range. Um, you know, he, he's he's just he's he's ahead of Cambo. I, I like Cambosa a lot. Yeah, what he Cambosa, did with friend of the, friend uh, of the show. I, he's I, been I, on the show. If yeah. people want to hear what he had to say, we did that interview right after he won the titles from Lopez. So you can go back and find that real classy guy. Great guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm rooting for yeah, him. Uh, he's a real fighter. Yes. Listen, both these guys, you got to root for. You can't, yes, 100%, you can't help but I root agree. for both of them. Uh, but uh, Cambosis comes up a little behind him when it comes to skill levels or ability levels and, and some of the pure ability areas, maybe. But Cambosis, I think that's fair. Not knocking him. Uh, I like him a lot. Yeah. Uh, I always said that. But Cambosis, his thing is timing. Timing can beat speed. He used timing against Teofimo, uh, who was a big puncher. And he dropped Teofimo because he timed him. You know, he, he timed him, found he could hit him with the right hand, and he timed him just right. Um, that tells me something. Tells me he's cerebral. What does that mean? I already know Haney's cerebral. But give. I, I'll tell you what it means. He should be better the second time. Campo, even though I just said Haney, uh, a lot of things suit up for him and, and line up for him to have an even better experience, but Cambosis too, because a guy that depends on timing, not speed, doesn't have those skill levels where he could depend just on his pure ability, his, his genetics. He has to do it other ways. That means he's got to think. That means he's got to overcome. You develop other skill sets. He has some of those other skill sets. They come in handy when somebody's faster than you, when somebody's more skilled genetically than you are, quite frankly. And I think what it speaks to and what it would probably align itself to, I would think, is that he would be better the second time because he would have studied what he did wrong. He would have seen it because, again, he knows he needs to help himself in those areas that he can't depend only on his physical assets. So he would go. He would go to the refrigerator, so to speak. He would go to the to the cupboard, so to speak. You know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he he would go to these places. And he'll go to the film room, and I think he'll look and say, okay, I got to do more timing, and I got to do more of it, but sooner. I got to start it sooner. I can't let Haney get into a rhythm. I can't. He got into a rhythm, and I couldn't break that rhythm. I wasn't able. I got to break that rhythm with my timing like I did with Teofimo the first time. Uh, I mean, well, there was only one time, but when, when I won the world title and I upset the world, nobody expected me to win. Now nobody expects me to win again. So you already know he's good as an underdog. He, he, he fights good in that position. Some people fight better as an underdog. So for the reasons I just said, because they always had to overcome to make it. They didn't have the skills to do it just purely on physical ability. So I think it's going to suit him in a rematch that... He's going to see these things that he's got to be a little bit better at um, and a lot better at and a lot sooner at. And I think that he will, unlike some of our friends, here take constructive criticism. Here, here's see what he, because he never had that ability. He never had nobody that was just telling him, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread and Coca-Cola put together. You know, he never had that. He, he had to go and earn it in a different way. So I think that he'll be more prone to look at the things that are warts, look at the things that none of us like to look at. And, and I think that will help him to have a better fight. I think he's going to have a better fight. I'm still picking Haney. I'm still picking Haney, but I think that he will have a better fight. 
Okay, is that fair, Ken? Very. Got a good breakdown? Good, as, good analysis? That's as thorough as it gets. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know the fans will appreciate it, too, because usually I'm like a pretty good litmus test for what the people want to hear, I think. The uh, truth. <laughs> we want the truth. I'm going to throw one other thing in there, okay? I just... I can't help it. You brought me into this today, starting it, and I asked Rob to get it up there. I, I want a clip. I want a clip from, I think it speaks to our show. It speaks to what I believe in, to what our fans believe in, I believe, uh, and stand by. I want a clip from that movie, A Few Good Men. With It was a great movie, great acting, great scenes, great lines with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise when... When uh, Nicholson, he's on, he's on stand, he's on the trial, right? And he's at the stand, and and he says to the lawyer, who's Tom Cruise, w uh, "What do you want?" And he says, "I want the truth." And he says, "You can't handle the truth." <laughs> I I love it. I love it. I want the truth. Some people can't handle the truth, but you know what? We're blessed that we have some people around us that can, and. I think sometimes life comes down to that. All right, who well, can I, handle the truth? So can we of get the that truth, up there? Rob's gonna get it up there for me. If, if Rob says he's gonna do it, Rob will do it. Rob will move a Heck mountain. It, I know he will. He's, I know he will. He's the magician. I know he will. He's the That's pod the father, the father the of all pods. That's the um, truth. He's he's literally like a, a brother. I love that guy. There's he's, a reason why Evander Holyfield was was named the truth. Yep. I mean, really, really, really. There's a reason why he was named and why he's one of my favorite fighters of all time. Isn't but he the real deal? He was named, real deal. Oh, oh, the real deal. You're right. But I named him the truth. The real deal. <laughs> but, but you know what? Alan right. Iverson but was the, the real, truth. But, but, but no, the no, no. The real deal. But what is the real deal? The real yeah, deal is the truth. Yep. Same the thing. The real deal is the truth. Hey, I was going to get it to where I want to get it to, <laughs> no matter what. You're the best. You know that. That's why you're you the best. That. So you're the, Let's go to the, that's next why you're the fight. voice Let's go of to all the combat sports, whether the combat community likes it or not, we're taking over. No, they uh, like it. No, they I'm like kidding. it. Most of them. I know. Most of them. All the ones most that don't are, uh, have a problem with themselves. Well, uh, well the ones that don't. Here, here, Ken, Ken, again. Okay? Here. here, here. Oh, it's so crazy no, to me when people saying, get, ups, wait, get upset hold, about hold words on, on the internet. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Well, there is one that we need the truth on, and this is a good one because we are obviously very friendly with the great Ryan Garcia, the handsomest kid in boxing by by a mile. Uh, Ryan Garcia, Tank Davis, these guys are going back and forth. Interesting I, fight. I love to see this fight, to your point, if so it happened interesting. Earlier. Go ahead, finish. Different, I'm sorry. different Go ahead. completely different styles for me in terms of um, attitudes and, and, and fight style in the ring. But I'm dying to hear what, you, what, what your thoughts are here. Again, we have a good relationship with Ryan, and I know you exchange text messages occasionally with him. But like we talked about, you're always going to get the truth, even if someone's feelings get hurt. Hey, listen, the truth is the truth. I, uh, I came down on him a couple times on our show, and guess what? He's, guess what? He's still your friend. Guess what? Guess what? I think he appreciated. it. Anyway, look, um, here's the, and that speaks to his strength, the greatest for strength sure. you can have. For sure, because you have greatest been, because you have been it's critical not your power, it's not your, it's not your speed, it's not your footwork, it's not your combinations. Your greatest strength is the ability to face something that's uncomfortable, something that's, that's, that sometimes is inconvenient, and to be able to face it, to be able to face it and deal with it. To, to be able to make a choice under pressure of how I will behave today, how I will behave, how I will act, even when, when it feels like that choice is being taken away from you. It's not taken away from you. You give it up, but it's not taken away from you. Never, unless you give it up. That's your greatest ability, to have the power to do those things. And that's called character, my friend. That's called character. That's not called speed. That's not those neon talents, you know, power and all those things. No, that's character. That's the ability to sometimes even have to do the truth. Listen, if this fight, speaking of the truth, if this fight, Ryan Garcia and Tank Davis took place maybe a little earlier, I would have probably maybe taken Davis. I, truth, truth. But now it's different. I think that Garcia has done a lot of growing. A lot of growing, a lot of maturing. I think he's gone through some difficult things. I think we all do. I think everyone does. But um, 
I think that I think he's gone through some growth pains, uh, some things of far as finding himself, maturing, you might call it, gaining confidence, growing up, facing the devil that knocks at your door sometimes, your doubts, your inhibitions. We all have them. I think he's I think he's gone through a lot of that. And I think he's gotten better. And I think he's gotten to a better place, a stronger place. A place that maybe he wasn't at before if he would have fought Tank before. But I think he's at that place now. I don't know. I think he still can keep traveling towards that. But I think that he's I think he's made a lot of distance up. And I think that he's he's gotten to a place that he needs to be to be able to handle this kind of fight. Now, the fight will break down in obvious parameters. Ryan, they're both young. No doubt Tank's been in with probably better fighters, more tested in those ways. I, I'm, I'm not going to deny that. But it comes down to what you believe. What you believe, what you think you've been tested, what you think you can deal with, and if you've gotten there. And I think Ryan believes that he's ready. I know Tank does. I think that... Ryan, of course, has to use his physical advantages of length, height, you know, his ability to control range, his jab, his, you know, everything that comes with that, uh, quick hands, precise punching, everything. He's got to be able to control that range and control his ego, not get into places where Ryan, where Tank wants him to get to, which would be a little closer, a little tighter, more of a phone booth. Or somewhere around that. Now, Tank, as I said earlier, I gave him a lot of, I, I think a lot of Tank in the ring. I think that he, he can do a lot of things. Hopefully, Garcia doesn't look at him as a one-dimensional punch, and I'm sure he don't because I think Garcia, part of Garcia's strengths is his, again, his cerebralness, his brain, that he's not dumb. And Tank can counter punch. Tank can get you to shrink. What do I mean by that? Teddy, what do you mean shrink? Get you to shrink. Get you to give up your height and come to him a little bit where he can counter you like he did in his last fight where he destroyed that guy, the undefeated fighter that he destroyed. I can't think of his name, but, you know, um, it's not hard to figure out and hard to find. There's two ways, if you really know this business, there's two ways to get to a taller guy. One is to work your way in, coming forward, moving your head, you know, and all that stuff. And, and to work your way in. The other way is to go the opposite way, to step out and invite the guy to give up his height and entrap him, get him to come to you and trap him in a you know counter situation you know where you, as a, you can shrink him, shrink him, shrink him, make him become smaller um, without him realizing that he's doing that. Tank can do all those things. Again, Ryan's got to be aware of all that. Uh, I think Ryan controls the outside, controls range. I think Tank will figure out ways, whether it's to faint, whether it's to try to shrink him by stepping out and setting traps, or whether it's to just take his damn feet and move forward, moving his head. Tank, you know, we give credit to guys like Shakur Stevenson for being a good defensive fighter, which he is. He is. Mayweather, one of the best ever. You know, Pernell Whitaker, all these great fighters. But Tank Davis, because he's aggressive, doesn't get credit for that. He's a good defensive fighter. He knows what the fig he's doing. Uh, so we forget that. Roberto Duran was a good defensive fighter, but he was aggressive, so we forgot that. We forgot that. So he's Tank Davis is going to use all his tricks up his sleeve. Every, every, anything he has to do, feints, step back, try to draw him in, work, work his way in move his head, slip, go to the body. Go to that slim, big body of uh, of Garcia. Garcia, you know, has that long, lean body. He's going to try to go to that body. Um, I think what's an interesting X factor is what weight this is at. If it's at 140, I think it's an advantage for Garcia because he's growing. He's growing. I don't think that he's, he's filling out. He's got the frame to fill out. I don't think that Tank has that frame. I think Tank is best suited at 135. So if it goes to 140, I think that Garcia's getting stronger. He's growing. He's he's maturing, both mentally and physically. Um, I, I 
I think he's growing into his frame, and, and I think it benefits him at 140. Uh, I'm just saying that. That's an X factor. That's an intangible. It's got to be thrown out there when you're doing this job the right way uh, and breaking it all down. I think, again, very interesting fight. Very dangerous fight. A lot of danger for Garcia, for Ryan, because uh, this guy really can put the lights out. He really can. Um, you can't get caught going back. He'll look to catch you going straight back and step with you and catch you that way if he can't get you the other way. He'll go to your body, try to, again, break you down by going to the, that long body. I think you're going to see all of that. You're going to see all of that. And you're going to find out. You're going to find out if Garcia is there yet. I think, I think we think Tank's there, pretty much. Not that he can't be tested more. He can. But he's been tested a little bit more, I think, uh, so far. A little bit more than, than um, Garcia. Garcia's biggest test so far has probably been the Campbell fight, where, where he stepped up in a top guy with Campbell, and he, uh, you know, he got dropped. He got off the floor, and he behaved, like a, he behaved the way a champion's supposed to behave. And he got the job done. And he found out that he could rely on himself. That was important. So, very interesting fight. Very dangerous fight. I think uh, it can, it's danger for Tank too because if he reaches in a little bit, that kind of left hook of Garcia is as good as any. It's as good as any. As good as any. He's that good with it. So, very interesting. Very, um, I want to give Garcia maybe a little edge that that if he's going to fight a perfect fight, which I think he has to almost fight a perfect fight because I don't think there's a margin for error when you're in there with that kind of puncher. I don't think there's a big margin for error. So he has to fight on almost perfect. That's hard to do. An almost perfect fight uh, to control the outside and, and you know, to just to control those territories that way consistently for 12 rounds that's not easy with a package a package not just a puncher a package like tank davis uh if i had to i i i mean i could go either way i tell you it's a toss-up fight i could make an argument for either one to win and that's when you know you got a good fight that's when you know you got a good fight you could make an argument either way how's that is that fair ken more than fair. That is as thorough as you're going to get anywhere. Um, one last one I want to touch on. With This is a pretty good show considering how slow um, the weekend was for fighting in general. Um, but there, I feel like we're right on the finish line for the Crawford-Spence fight. And obviously, if and when this gets made, we'll do the full thorough. Uh, we'll give it the full and thorough fight with Teddy Atlas treatment. We'll give you the fight plan, the breakdowns, the what to expect. But just quickly on the surface, what do you think? Is this fight going to get made? And what you like what don't you like etc etc well again contracts don't fight like don king once said contracts don't fight people fight and until it's signed on the dotted lines it's not a fight yet um uh, there's having some problems here and there supposedly they agreed to major terms or main terms but uh, it's not done yet i think i think it will be done hopefully not in three years you know, like some of these big fights got done five years too late. Where they're still in their prime, these guys. You know, they're getting older, but they're still in their prime. And it's not too late yet. Uh, it's got to be done now, though. Uh, it's it's the fight you want to see. I haven't seen a welterweight fight like this uh, with this kind of really matchup and this kind of real, real, you know, just build up and 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 just anticipation since the 80s when you had Hearns and Lennon. It reminds me of that. Where, where you had that, I know some people might say Lennon and Durant, but it reminds me of Lern Lennon and Hearns. You had that matchup in the 80s, but the 80s had a lot of good matchups. First of all, you had network TV where everyone could see it for free, basically. And for the most part, you know, some of them went to closed circuit, whatever. But you, you, had, you had that element. And the most important thing was you had special fighters, lifetime fighters, talent of a lifetime, talent that you don't see too often. You had that kind of talent. You got that kind of talent around today, some of it. But the difference back then was you had a lot of that special, special lifetime talent, but they fought each other. That's what you don't get today. That was the difference in the 80s. They fought each other. They got in a ring with each other. They tested, they tested that great talent with each other, with the best. And... 
you don't have much of that. I hope we get this one. Again, it, it's, it reminds me of the anticipation for the Hearns Leonard first fight way back in the 80s. I would say, to break it down the proper way, you got, you got Spence, who's the, he's the horse. He's the bigger, naturally bigger welterweight. Crawford has w- moved up in three different weight classes, won titles, amazing. He's got the skeleton to do that, kind of like I was talking about Ryan Garcia. He has the frame where he could do that. He carried his power with him. That's Not everyone does that. Pacquiao did it. You know, it's unusual. He, he did it. Um, he's special. They're both special. And they both conduct themselves special outside the ring as well as inside the ring, which is important, uh, like champions, the way you're supposed to do. Yep. Spence, well, uh, Spence, is, Spence is the horse. Spence is the big, naturally bigger guy, strong, good body puncher. He can put pressure, but he can also box. Don't miss that boat. Don't miss that on him. That's how he beat Mickey Garcia. Mikey Garcia so easily, even though Garcia was a smaller guy, he used his jab. He, he can box. He was an Olympian. He, he's technically solid. He can box. He can counter. He can do that. Yeah, he's aggressive when he, for the most part, but he can also box. He's got skills, and he's got technique. So, because a lot of people think only Crawford has that. No, no. Spence has that. Spence has it. So, Spence likes to be aggressive when he can, when it makes sense, but he'll box when it makes sense, use his jab. Everything's off his jab. Everything's off his jab. Fundamentals. Fundamentals, baby. He, again, determined, tough, uh, you know, physical, tries to impose his physicality on you, puts water in the basement, goes to the body, goes up and down. Uh, he's terrific. Um, knows how to put them together. Crawford. Crawford technically real solid. Doesn't keep his hands up as good as Spence. His hand placement get, get, he gets a little looser, but gets them up when they have to be up. Maybe you could time him sometimes stepping back. Maybe. But you're, you got to be willing to take the chance to do that. And you got to be on time. I think Crawford, again, not the naturally bigger guy, but he, you know he's carried his power. Crawford, he can do everything. He could go get you. He can. He likes to control range with the jab. He likes to control range. He like. He can counter with the best of them. As I said, when he has to go and and you know go and get in the kitchen with the heat, he'll get in your kitchen. He'll go in there. He can use the ring. He can use his legs when he has to. Everything. Whatever he's got to do, he's got to take a pick at you for three rounds using his legs. He'll take a pick at you using his legs. He's a cerebral guy too. All the top guys are. He, he's got all those abilities, the technique. Here's where he differs. He may be the greatest switch hitter since Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle was a great switch hitter, by the way. He could hit from the left side of the plate, the right side of the plate, power and average. That is Crawford. I mean, uh, that is Crawford. Uh, he... He is a, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a better switch hitter. They can go lefty or righty and not miss a beat. Southpaw, orthodox, uh, either way. Uh, the commentator, one of the, com- the former world champion who was uh, light heavyweight champion, also middleweight champ, tremendous fighter, all, obviously great fighter um, uh, with ESPN. I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Andre um, Andre, Andre Ward. Ward Andre Ward was a great switch hitter too, uh, right up there in that class. Not too many people in that level, that class. Uh, Crawford is is unbelievable in that area. So he's got those options, but here's where he separates. Instinct. He's the he might be the greatest thing. I've this is a big statement for me. I've seen a lot of fighters. I had the blessing of being with Custom Auto for seven years up in Catskill and we had Big Fight uh, Inc. with Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton sent us all the tapes. Henry Armstrong, whoever, everybody. I, I saw the great fighters. I saw them all. Sugar Ray Robinson, everybody. He might have the greatest instinct of any fighter at Crawford I've ever seen. He just instinctually, innately knows what to do at the right time. And the great ones know that. Uh, I once did a 
show with him for ESPN. It's out there if you want to find it, where I broke down film with him. And we went into a studio with a ring in it, and we got in a ring, and we, we broke it down on camera. Then we got in a ring, we showed it. And I was showing him when he was tested for the first time on his way up against Gamboa, former world champion, a little past himself at that point, but he was a Cuban fighter, uh, you know, that came from the great Cuban Olympic teams. He won a gold medal, and he, he, he had great hand speed, great power. He was a featherweight. He had moved up to fight Crawford. It was Crawford's first real test, and he hurt Crawford. Crawford was winning, but he hurt him. At, uh, late, pay, late uh, middle part, late part of the fight, he hurt him. And I watched it, and I saw something. And when I was getting ready for the show, I'm at home and, you know, breaking it down. I said, wait, I got to look at this again. I got to look at it again. I got to look at it again. I looked at it about seven times in a row to be sure I was right. And when he got hurt, I think if I remember correctly, I could be off. But whatever it was, he was in the orthodox stance. He got, uh, he was in the southpaw stance, I think. He got caught a right hand, got hurt. And as he staggered back, his legs went out a little bit. As he staggered back, he switched to southpaw. No accident. He kept his wits about him and instinctively switched to south, switched out of southpaw to orthodox for two reasons. One, he wouldn't be as vulnerable to the right hand, and two, he would have the kind of left hook where Gamboa was looking for right hands now. He knew it, and he might get a little right hand happy and a little fat with his right hand, a little loose with it, a little you know greedy, if you will, and reach in and get reckless with it. And then he had the kind of left hook from the orthodox position he wouldn't have had from the southpaw position. Yeah. And as he was going back hurt, he was doing all these things. And I had to watch it like seven, eight times to be sure I was seeing what I was seeing. It was extraordinary. So when I broke it down with Crawford, I showed it to him for the first time. And I said, I said, look what you did here. And I broke it down. I said, did you know you did this? And an honest kid, honest fighter. What do you think he says? No. <laughs> this is the first time I ever saw it. That's instincts. That's innate instincts. That's special. That, that is not taught. That, that is special. Not everyone gets that. That's what separates this man. And that's why I would have to pick him in that fight as much as I love both. And I love Spence. I love Spence. That's the edge. That's the difference. And um, it, it'll be a hell of a fight. I hope it's made. Again, how's that, Ken? Was that, are you, is that up to your satisfaction? That's you great marathoner, <laughs> you. That's as thorough as you're going to get everywhere. And you know what I was thinking about with regards to Twitter? Anytime I think about I'm going to send a tweet that isn't anything other than praising others, I take a beat and have one of these feel frees. They make me relax. It's a kava-based kava botanical tonic from botanictonics.com. We have a special offer for our listeners. If you use the promo code ATLAS at the point of checkout, they'll give you 40% off, and I promise you're going to like these things. They're, like I said, it's like a euphoric kava-based feeling after you drink. It helps me relax, gives me some peace of mind, some clarity. Feel free, botanictonics.com. Use the promo code ATLAS. Teddy, that was a and thorough... If that don't work if that don't work <laughs> remember tissues tissues <laughs> take really, a, take a deep they, breath relax a, anyone could get it anyone could get their hands on tissues yep. you know just just wipe your eyes you know take a deep breath drink some of the stuff ken's talking about you know what i mean really really inhale deeply Yo. Uh, do a little yoga you know <laughs> what and and at the end of the day Get on your hands and knees, and this is where I'm not joking, and just thank the good Lord that you have the opportunities you have, and um, a lot of people don't. A lot yeah. of people don't have that. And just a quick reminder, if you like what Teddy has to say and you'd like to hear more about Teddy's origin story and how he came up, we talked a lot about Custom Auto today. Please check out his book, Atlas, From the Streets to the Ring, A Son Struggled to Become a Man. There it is in paperback, available on Amazon, but you can also get it on audible.com. And uh, it's an excellent, excellent read, a great listen. I've listened to it a couple I know times one while I'm running. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ken. Love you. Um, I know one person will not be ordering that book. 
Um, but that's okay. Maybe he will. Maybe, <laughs> maybe he, he will. will. Maybe, maybe, maybe he'll realize hey, I gotta it wasn't tell you malicious. When it you, was constructive. When you, when you read that, uh, I remember I was talking about our guest, our house guest, Pedro. Yeah. We were blessed to yeah, have yeah. him come over. He he loves when you do those things. Yeah. He 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 says, I really, I love when he does that. And 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 again, seriously, he said, Ken is great. He said, <laughs> yeah. Ken is great. And oh, I, that's I nice. said, okay, okay, you said it twice. That's <laughs> enough. Well, that's that's. I was learning enough. from the master. Um, but anyway, yeah, Teddy, great episode this week. Really appreciate all the insight and the uh, thoroughness that you always bring, and the fans know that. And uh, if you're listening, please do us a favor. Hit subscribe on the YouTube button or on the YouTube page. Just subscribe to the show. It helps us out a lot. And I know that the, um, the advertisers appreciate those numbers as well. So please keep the comments coming. Like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. We appreciate you guys. And we'll be back uh, next week with some more creative content. I think we've got another slow week coming up. So feel free to weigh in in the comments if there's something in particular you guys want to hear about. Don't be shy, not that you ever are, but feel free to uh, hit us with some comments and some suggestions either on Twitter or in the YouTube comments. Twitter will probably be better. And uh, we'll try to cover it next week. Teddy, have a great week. Thank you for everything this week, and we will uh, see you guys next Monday. I'm going to go have a cup of tea and think about my great friends, all great friends over across the pond and everywhere, everywhere. Tea is universal. Yep. It's universal. Thank you, guys. Have a great one.